Good evening and welcome to this special Secret Life of the Forest DVD release event right here on Blue Mountain Television. We are happy that you have tuned in this evening. My name is Lowell Mann and I am the station manager here at Blue Mountain Television. It has been a tremendous blessing for Blue Mountain Television to produce and air Secret Life of the Forest. Mike Denny and Daniel Biggs have done an amazing job with this series. It has been fun watching them for the past year and a half craft this series into what you see today. We have heard from many people who have been excited about this series and their praise has been astounding. We've had many community organizations sponsor this series, some of them big players in our community. How much do you know about the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation or Blue Mountain Wildlife? a Raptor Rehabilitation Clinic, or the Blue Mountain Audubon Society. Tonight you will hear a little bit about these organizations and a few more. You'll also hear why they felt that it was important to support this series. We'll also hear from Mike Denny and Daniel Biggs, the creative minds behind Secret Life of the Forest. They will be sharing plans for their next project, Secret Life of the Desert, Deserts of the Pacific Northwest and they will explain to you how you can support this upcoming project. Up until now, the only way to see Secret Life of the Forest was through the broadcast on Blue Mountain Television. You can now purchase Secret Life of the Forest on DVD. The cost is $50 for the entire set. Give us a call at 509-529-9149 to place your order. Or you can order online on our website www.bmt.tv slash DVD. Once again, thanks for joining us this evening. Hello, I'm Daniel Biggs, the producer, the editor, and photographer of The Secret Life of the Forest. This series, which you're about to see, uh, took around 18 months to film and edit. Mike Denny, a naturalist and educator, has been studying the Blue Mountains for about 40 years now. He has an incredible knowledge of the soils, the plants, and the insects, and the animals of this section of the Blues, and he understands what a treasure these mountains are, and how we are affected by how we treat this precious range. Mike has graciously donated his knowledge, his time, and his money to help create this series with only one request, to educate our community and beyond about this delicate and special mountain range we live next to. Whether or not you believe it, we have a relationship with the Northern Blue Mountains here in the Walla Walla Valley. We rely on its life-giving waters and the fresh air these mountains provide. Tonight, we will also reveal the exciting plans to create another original educational program that educates and connects communities with another special environment. We would like to begin filming Secret Life of the Desert, the Deserts of the Pacific Northwest. We will start our journey into the secret life of the forest, the Northern Blue Mountains, with Disc 1 and Episode 1, Intro to the Northern Blues. Here we start with a look at the entire Blue Mountain Range, which stretch 400 miles long and 100 miles wide, which covers most of Northeast Oregon and up into Southeast Washington. We then tighten the focus on the uniqueness of the Northern Blue Mountains, including the plants, geology, and Native Americans. The episode concludes with the history and introduction of new arrivals that have forever changed the Northern Blue Mountains. Hello and welcome. I am your guide to a marvelous outdoor adventure. My name is Mike Denny. This program is a beautifully filmed 13 part series on the marvels of the natural history of the Northern Blue Mountains in southeastern Washington and northeastern Oregon. In this series, we will be exploring and discovering the vast diversity of life that call the Northern Blue Mountains home. We will take visits to many sites in the Northern Blues that host some amazing animals and native plants that most folks this day and age simply miss. Join us on this adventure in a part of the world very few even know exists and even fewer have been to. 
We will start our exciting journey into the secret life of the forest in the Northern Blue Mountains. Our exploration will begin in the foothills along the streams and rivers and up into the riparian zones. We will also look into the connections that are influenced by slope and soils. This journey will include many views of insects, blooming native plants, as well as amphibians, reptiles, fishes, birds, and mammals. This presentation is an introduction to a range of mountains that are 100 miles wide and over 400 miles long. Hello, I am glad to be before you this evening. This is an opportunity that will not come along like this very often. Blue Mountain TV is offering a chance for you to have and own the 13 episode series, The Secret Life of the Forest the Northern Blue Mountains, on a two-disc DVD set. This outstanding natural history exploration is the first of its kind to be filmed in the Northern Blue Mountains. So come join Dan and I in an adventure discovering this spectacular mountain range that covers all of Northeastern Oregon and part of Southeastern Washington State. Come with us as we view the vivid purples of Calypso orchids, and discover their other common name. Look into the big saffron yellow eyes of a great gray owl and be in awe. Learn to marvel at the amazing speed of a hunting tiger beetle. All this and much more is presented for your enjoyment and education about the Northern Blue Mountains and the living systems that sustain all life in this region. Learn of the impacts of the arrival of a new culture had on the native peoples and all of creation in the Northern Blue Mountains. Please call the Blue Mountain TV and find out how you can own this wonderful 13 episode DVD set. Call before this opportunity migrates out of here. In episode two, From the Soils Up, as we begin our exploration of the Northern Blues, it is necessary to share how important the soil is as the foundation of life for much of the planet. Soil sets the stage for plants to come, which in turn support other life forms. Discover how slope, aspect, and weather have a relationship with the vital soils, lichens, and mosses. Climate shift is also a topic it is ever-changing the very surface of the blues in a frightening way. The fungi are a large complex that come in so many shapes, sizes, colors, and functions in associations with other organisms. These include yeasts like candida, molds, slime molds, mushrooms, cup fungi morels, so-called toadstools, bracken fungi, puffballs, stinkhorns, and bird's nest mushrooms to name a few. Fungi are the most important agent of recycling in the natural world. Along with their partners like lichens, the fungi start the breakdown of organic and inorganic structures and systems after death or over time as in the case of rocks with lichens. Logs, branches, roots of dead and living plants. Fungi spores are always in the air and most living systems come under attack by one or more fungi spores almost constantly. These fungi are generalists and specialists with some only attacking insects, other species specific plants in different stages of their lives. Animals also come under attack from all kinds of spores, from molds and yeasts. The fungus of the world are present throughout the temperate and tropical regions. These organisms are the major agents of change that provide the catalyst that assists in returning plants and animals to the soils. The fungi are the most important recycling engineers in the natural world of the Northern Blue Mountains. 
In the Blue Mountains, mushrooms like the Boletus with spongy ventral sides of the cap and a coppery brown dorsal surface appear in early summer after the last late spring rains and snow. There are morels that hundreds of folks go looking for right after snow melt in burned over areas. Morels come in two types, the black morel of spring and the blonde morel of early summer. These are commercially harvested under permit in the Umatilla National Forest of Oregon and Washington. Morels are considered an extreme delicacy by chefs and cooks the world over. Then there are the coral mushrooms that range from pink to pale yellow. These unique looking fungi do indeed look like some species of coral under a tropical ocean. The next are the chanterelles that have gills all up along the stem out to the uplifted edge of the ventral surface of the cap, creating what looks like a deep cup. These very edible mushrooms range in color from light tan to yellow to deep orange and rust red. Hello, my name is Linda Herbert and I am president of Blue Mountain Land Trust. We are a not-for-profit, non-governmental organization which collaborates with communities and willing landowners to preserve and protect those qualities of the Blue Mountain region which makes it such a great place to live. From the farmlands to the riparian areas, from the forests to the diverse recreational opportunities. Our service area covers 11 counties in Washington and Oregon, which includes the entire 400 mile range of the Blue Mountains. Our northern unit is based here in Walla Walla, and the southern unit has two staff persons and is in John Day. We hold 14 easements, totaling 6,500 acres, protecting forever prime wildlife habitat riparian areas of rivers and streams, farm and ranch lands, and of course, gorgeous landscapes. While conservation is our main focus, we also have missions of education and recreation. We are sure that if we can get you out learning about the land and enjoying the land, you'll come to love it the way we do, and you'll support our conservation efforts. Our educational offerings continue to grow. Our largest and longest standing program is Learning on the Land, which connects folks with the land through a wide variety of topics and events. We take field trips, hikes, sponsor lectures and classes, learning about agriculture of all types, geology, botany, forest, fish, and wildlife management, We'll host watercolor and photography classes, learn to hunt mushrooms, hear poetry about nature, and much, much more. This season, we have dozens of events, eight of which are in the John Day, and there is something for everybody. Kids under 17 are free. Nature Kids is a collaborative effort with the USDA Forest Service and offers high quality natural world education with events monthly through October. Kids get to explore hands-on natural resources with conservation-related activities, hear expert scientists, and enjoy a craft activity related to the topic. All Nature Kids events are free and open to the public. An upshot of Nature Kids is Nature Kids on the Farm. This week-long day camp held at Welcome Table Farm has become so popular that we're adding more sessions this year. Kids have a blast learning about raising food and flowers and tending farm animals. There is a fee for enrollment. Check out the entire video on our website at bmlt.org. Our newest education program is Blue Mountain Field Science course for high schoolers, offered by Whitman College professors Nick Bader and Tim Parker. The focus of this week-long day camp is learning about the geological and biological processes that created our unique landscape. 
The kids will be going on daily field trips in the region in addition to their classroom time. I'm happy to say that this class has been well received, but sad to say it now has a waiting list. But please check out our website under the Education tab to learn more about all of these programs. Registration is all done online. You may have heard of the Blues Crew, as we have gotten phenomenal front page press lately. This is the trail maintenance arm of BMLT's Recreation Committee. We're collaborating with the Forest Service to do trail work in the Umatilla and Malheur National Forests. They supply the tools and expertise, and we supply the willing volunteers. Closer to home, we're collaborating with the Corps of Engineers on trail work at Bennington Lake and with the Audubon Society at the Rempel Natural Area. After two well-attended work parties, there is still plenty left to do. In our first year, we logged 1,000 volunteer hours, and this year already we have close to 700 under our belts. It is very gratifying work, and we're delighted by the number of new faces showing up at our work parties. If you love to be outdoors and like the idea of making trails more accessible for all, check out our website for our calendar of work days. Tools and protective personal equipment are provided. One thing that I am very proud of with the Land Trust is the amount of collaboration that we have cultivated with other agencies and organizations in our region. Besides the Forest Service, Audubon, and the Corps of Engineers, we work closely with the Public Library, the Sustainable Living Center, the Water Environmental Center, Community Council and the Regional Trails Project. The list goes on. These are all people who are working to sustain and protect our natural environment. People who share our vision and goals. We can accomplish so much more to further our goals by working together. That is why the Land Trust was excited to host the preview screening of The Secret Life of the Forest, the Northern Blue Mountains, at Maxi Auditorium last winter. What an exciting evening that was. People were amazed. The response to the video and to Mike and Daniel's words was so affirming. People love nature. As I said before, we want to educate people on the natural beauty that awaits them just beyond their doorsteps so that they will be eager to get out and recreate for their pleasure, or for their health, and then be concerned about preserving it. These beautiful DVDs are a wonderful way to do just that. And that is why Blue Mountain Land Trust continues to support this project. And we hope that you will too. In episode three, the community of plants, the plant communities dictate what species of insects, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, birds, fishes, and parasites that can survive on each slope aspect. Soil type, soil depth, slope aspect, and elevation all determine what plants flourish and grow on any one site. In this episode, we move from the soils and into the plant communities that those soils can host, including many beautiful wildflowers and several species of stunning orchids. There is a wild plant family that are known as the native orchids. There are about 10 species of this rare to uncommon plant family in the northern Blue Mountains. There are several individuals in the forest that have very specific requirements that must all come together for them to grow. I will share several of these spectacular plants in this episode. The first is the mountain lady slipper which is a stickler for having all requirements being met before it will grow and bloom. First, we know that the soils must be nutrient rich and that a fire needs to have passed through the area. 
The seeds of this plant are right at 1 64th of an inch and are reddish tan in color. It takes one seed to grow and eventually mature. After 10 years have passed, it then blooms with one beautiful bedpan shaped white flower with purple ribbing and a yellow anther. It is pollinated by ants or flies and after 10 days, the flower fades and drops off the end of the stalk, leaving the growing fertilized seed pod, which by the end of July is dried out and by August is ready to open and spread its tiny seeds. Another orchid species is the Calypso orchid, also known as the fairy slipper, a type of plant that is saprophytic by nature and is spectacular purple this plant has no chlorophyll and therefore is reliant on other plants to provide sustenance and energy for it to grow and bloom. This is a plant that only grows and flowers under a 85% canopy cover and must have ample moist soils along with a relationship with a fungus. These spectacular blossoms are truly eye-catching. One other orchid species I will mention is the phantom orchid, a rare to unexpected plant that is pure white and once again has no chlorophyll within the plant. This columnar 6 to 15 flowered plant is pollinated by moths and flies, small native bees and wasps. These pale plants emerge in late June under a dark canopy and depending on late spring rains proceed to bloom for 10 to 14 day period. Very few folks ever get to see this interesting plant that is also a saprophyte, that also has a relationship with a species of fungus and other vascular plants off which it gets its nutrients. High in the northern blues are also other orchids like spotted coral root, In episode four, An Anchor for Life, we move from the soils to the seed, then the plants, and then we witness a rapid and beautiful process. Here we can observe new relationships forming. Plant communities allow for a vast diversity of other organisms that are all dependent on plants throughout their lives. In this episode, we reveal some of the amazing insects and plants that depend upon each other. Get ready to witness the stunning butterflies and other wonderful pollinators of the Northern Blue Mountains. As air temps warm in late April, so as in all other Lepidoptera or butterflies and moths, plants are the key for each species. This one group of insects are completely reliant on flowering plants to produce the next generations. Plants are their future. Some other spectacular butterflies that inhabit the northern Blue Mountains are the painted lady, the lilac bordered copper, the square spotted blue, the viceroy, and the California tortoiseshell, to name a very few.
In episode five, A Place in the Sun, we go high into the Northern Blue Mountains, where lives a whole group of species and plants and animals that reside along transition zones between the deep, moist soil aspects of the north and east of the thin, soiled grasslands along the ridges and down the southwest facing slopes into the numerous eroded canyons. These communities provide a unique diversity of animals not located in the bunch grass, thin soiled sites, or in the cool, moist soiled, steep forested slopes. In the northern blues, up to about 4,500 feet in elevation, and all through the region's riparian buffers, lives a big, heavy owl that hunts, nests, and roosts in all types of habitat, from big sagebrush to western junipers to big cottonwoods and tall ponderosa pines. This is the great horned owl. These big raptors hunt for many different species of prey from snakes to house cats to fox kits to mice and mallards. There is very little that they will not attempt to take. The one animal that they often catch is the striped skunk. Striped skunks assume that most predators will leave them alone in order to avoid being hit with their oily spray that has a nasty smelling odor. Great horned owls do not care about the skunk's chemical defensive strategy as these owls have no olfactory and cannot taste or smell anything. So when the skunk goes for a standoff with a great horned owl, it is most likely to lose its life. Most mice and rats that these big raptors catch and eat are swallowed whole, head first. Though some rodents, the owl will crush the back end of the skull and take the brain. About six hours after ingesting a vole or small rodent, the owl regurgitates a lozenge about three and a half to four inches long that is covered with mucus and is comprised of all the hair, nails, and bones from the last meals. These are known as pellets, and not only owls produce them in the bird world. Great horned owls lay four eggs on a platform or old nest built by another bird species. No owl species builds its own nest and is totally dependent on other large nest building birds. Anyway, back to the great horned owl and its young. These chicks hatch out as they were laid about 26 hours apart. So the first chick becomes the dominant sibling in the nest and will always be fed by the adult. The second chick that hatches also has an outstanding chance of being fed and surviving. The third and fourth chicks will only survive if there is enough prey base in the area. And if there is just enough for the first two older chicks, then the last two chicks will starve and be removed from the nest. This nesting strategy is an insurance strategy used by all owl species in the Blue Mountains. The adults work hard to replace themselves each breeding season. The breeding season in the low elevation sites starts the third week of January and up in the foothills in mid-February. Young great horns grow rapidly and soon lose their white down and as the flight and body feathers emerge, they become very active and vocal. The adult male is seldom far away. Young owls move away from the nest platform early and can be scattered all over in the area, calling for the adults to feed them. The adults always know where each chick is. There is a family of beetles known as tiger beetles that live on warm, bare soil situations 
along well-trod paths, along dirt roads, and around the margins of ponds and lakes beside drying puddles. These are fierce predators that have every advantage over their prey. These beetles are rapid flyers and can cover dozens of meters in just a few seconds. Their ability to run across the surface of the ground in unvegetated sites is unparalleled among other beetles, save for their near cousins, the ground beetles. These inch-long beetles can run so fast chasing other insect prey species that they get ahead of the information pouring in through their eyes and they must stop for a few moments to allow their brains to catch up as to what they are seeing in relation to the prey species they are chasing. Tiger beetles are active hunters and are largely solitary by nature here in the blues. These beetles lay an egg just beneath the surface of the ground and after several days, depending on moisture and soil temps, the egg hatches into what is known as a grub or instar. The six-legged soft-bodied larvae has a flat hard head with large dagger sharp mandibles, all the better to grab unsuspecting insects with. These grubs then dig a burrow eight to 10 inches deep and they use their head as the door at the top of the burrow. Any small passing insect is fair game as these instars will burst up out of its ground burrow with such speed that few passing insects ever see it coming. The grub then chews up the bug, sucks out all the internal fluids, and chucks the lifeless exoskeleton up and away from its burrow. The process of maturing into an adult tiger beetle can take up to 24 months here in the Northern Blue Mountains. We had a visit from Daniel this morning. He came out to shoot another segment for The Secret Life of the Forest. And but he was a little early and I wasn't ready, so we were in the middle of treating this baby great horned owl. Actually, it was a pretty big great horn, but it was still a fuzzy youngster that had come out of its nest a little early in the middle of a cow pasture and was trampled by the cows. So it had two broken legs and it came in on, on Friday and this is on a Monday, so we were rechecking and so we re-radiographed and redid the splints and uh, hopefully this little guy in another, it's already started to heal in just three days. And so hopefully in another week or so, he'll, we'll be able to take the splints off and he'll start using those legs and we can get him back with his family and he can finish learning how to be a great horned owl. Episode six is called The Birds of Prey. Right across the northern Blue Mountains, in each forested parcel lives good numbers of both nocturnal and diurnal raptors. These owls, hawks, eagles, and falcons are so important to the ecology and balance of this great mountain range. This episode takes a close look at the several species of owls, including the great gray, great horned, pygmy, barn, and the sawwet. Join us for spectacular footage of these nighttime raptors that some people spend a lifetime to see. Good evening. We are out here in the Northern Blue Mountains and we are so fortunate because we are standing in the territory of a great gray owl. And it's a pair of great grays and they have a nest here. Great gray owls are 27 inches long. They have a 42 to 44 inch wingspan and they are uh, tremendous parents. Uh, this particular nest is unusual because it's been built uh, uh, into a cavity that was excavated by pileated woodpeckers in an old aspen uh, stem. So the amazing thing is this uh, pair of great grays has nested here, and this is the third year that they have been here, which is really unusual. No owl in North America builds its own nest. So these great grays have learned that this site is available and they come and utilize this cavity. Uh, great grays are not known as cavity nesters. They typically like a flat open platform like an old hawk's nest or a raven nest. But in this case, they've selected a cavity 
and they currently have four chicks in this nest. And uh, it's been very, very interesting watching great grays feed and raise this clutch of uh, young. I'm James Payne, the Executive Director of Fort Walla Walla Museum, and I'd like to share a few stories. Recently we had three tremendous artifacts donated over the course of seven days. 
Each of these items has strong connections with the Blue Mountains. The excitement from each one of these could have carried me easily for a few months. First item came from Mark Clicker, one of our new board members. As a kid 45 years ago, he was exploring an old shed with his brother on the family farm. Before the Clickers owned this property, it was owned by Alfred Thomas, an old farm Mark thinks has the second oldest water rights in the county. Getting back to the young boys, uh, their adventure really began as they discovered a couple of handmade knives with antler handles. The blade from one of those is made from a file. Because steel used in files tends to be of a high quality, the practice of using them to make knives was not uncommon during the 19th century. The two knives resemble butcher's tools, which makes a lot of sense as the shed they were found in was right next to the old smokehouse. Meat was prepared and cut to size before the smoking process. While this discovery was more than enough to thrill the boys, an even greater treasure awaited them. In the back of the shed, buried beneath assorted junk, they found an old trap. This was not just any old trap, this was a monstrously large trap that may have been lying there for more than 100 years. Measuring 48 inches in length with jaws 15 inches, this double spring leg hole trap is larger than those used for black bears. It's the size used for grizzly bears. According to Mike Denny, our local expert and my go-to source for anything nature related, grizzlies existed in the Blue Mountains until the early 1920s. Bear traps are uncommon and grizzly bear traps are downright rare. Crudely made from scrap material, this hand-forged example is even more unusual as most surviving bear traps are cast steel. It is doubtful that this relatively lightweight trap was strong enough to hold a mad grizzly. I suspect if it had been lucky enough to clamp down on the leg of its target, the bear would have pulled it off with its teeth, tied it into a pretzel, and thrown it aside. This suggests that Mr. Thomas was losing some livestock in the early years of the farm, and he made a trap with the goal of ending his losses. Its association with Walla Walla history makes this trap a priceless find. It will be out on display later this year. Another significant donation occurred at the end of this week-long period. We had been working with the Washington State Railroad's Historical Society for more than a dozen years and decided to partner up on an exhibit on Dr. Dorsey Baker's only surviving locomotive. Purchased by Baker in 1877 and named the Blue Mountain, this narrow gauge engine is the oldest surviving locomotive from Washington State. During the 1860s gold rush in what is now Idaho, agricultural production blossomed in the Walla Walla area in part to produce food for the miners. As gold production ran down, miners left the region and a better system was needed to move food to the markets. Doc Baker proposed a railroad that would be a public utility, but it was voted down. After that, Baker decided to construct a railroad as a private endeavor. This transportation system, coupled with advancements in agricultural technology, helped develop the Walla Walla region as one of the breadbaskets of the world. The Washington State Railroad Historical Society has always been a small group of trained fanatics with a strong passion for preserving our state's railroad history. After the city of Pasco claimed their land for a proposed street improvement project, their collection was placed in storage. It was at that time that Walla Walla Sunrise Rotary helped relocate the engine to Fort Walla Walla Museum for an extended loan, and they also built an enclosure for its display. Ten other businesses participated in this project, and thousands of museum visitors already have benefited from seeing this exhibit. With their membership dwindling and no home from which to work, the Washington State Railroads Historical Society recently decided to disband. As part of this process, they transferred ownership of the Blue Mountain to Fort Walla Walla Museum. The engine comes with detailed notes for adding missing parts and $5,000 to support its refurbishment. A contingency of Rotarians made a trip to Pasco the following week to retrieve an assortment of parts to be used on this project. The locomotive's boiler is in rough shape and is unsafe to hold much pressure, so it will never be a full restoration. The goal will be to make it look as close as possible to when it was used in Walla Walla County. The Blue Mountain remains on display at the museum, so come by and check it out if you haven't already. We at Fort Walla Walla Museum recently provided special historical images that were used in the production of the series Secret Life of the Forest. 
We are very happy to be supporters of the series, and we hope you will consider supporting this program and the series to come. Episode 7 is called Raptors in Their Prey Base. Diurnal raptors are always present across the Northern Blue Mountains where they hunt rodents, reptiles, rabbits, birds, pup coyotes, fawn deer, and insects. These predatory birds and all those in between in size all hold vital positions and services to the ecology of this region. These birds of prey are composed of hawks, falcons, and eagles, and several owl species. You won't want to miss seeing and learning about these incredible raptors. Thinly scattered along the Toucanon River are several pairs of regal raptors, which is the largest member of the Budio family in North America. These massive hawks have a 56 inch wingspan and are named ferruginous hawk due to the rust red leggings and rust scapulars on their wings. The several pairs in the Toucanon River Canyon nest on huge nests that they have constructed and added to over the years. The female lays four eggs and typically raise four chicks. These big birds feed on mice, gophers, ground squirrels, and snakes along the rim that they hunt. They are a protected species and have no desire to be anywhere that there are humans. Their population is in sharp decline around the blues due to habitat loss, shooting, and encroachment of agriculture into the native grasslands. These wonderful big hawks return to the same nest year in and year out. The pair bonds are tight and the same pair will stay together for many years. Most of the population migrates off to the desert southwest in October, though a few individuals will overwinter in the Walla Walla Valley. Out in the exposed south-facing slopes where the bunch grasses dominate, the first wildflowers are now blooming. The spectacular grass widow with its lavender one inch wide blooms now cover whole hillsides. These early flowers are out for only six to eight hours depending on the ambient air temperatures and winds blowing across these slopes. Along with these wonderful purple forbs are brilliant saffron yellow biscuit roots or lomatiums in full shooting star display. Microflowers are also out by the score, blooming in whites, yellows, and oranges, along with many pollinators that have appeared in the last few warm days are bumblebees. In their black and yellows, some species also have orange-red splashes of color across their abdomen. It is these big ground nesting bees that come out early to take advantage of the surge in blooming flowers. There are more than three separate species of these amazing bees found here in early spring. Bumblebees are the primary pollinators of many early spring blooming native and invasive flowering plants. One of the native flowers that blooms in late April are thousands of blue camas, the spectacular sapphire blue carpet that these moist soil plants create attracts all kinds of pollinators from beetles to bees to hoverflies and moths along with little blue butterflies. Blue camas plants are prized by the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest who dig the bulbs of this plant for food. Another beautiful native blue purple flower that blooms in the same moist soil sites as the camas at the same time of year is the common larkspur. With its eye-catching purple-blue unique shaped blossoms, this plant also attracts numerous pollinators, despite the load of toxins this plant carries. This native plant is anything but edible. It is a delphinium species that is poison to mammals. 
It produces alkaloid-based poisons that can cause all kinds of organ failures if ingested by man or beast alike. Spring in the Northern Blues is a time of ample water with snowmelt, rainstorms, and on occasion, late snowstorms. All this moisture allows for the renewal of life in this region that by early June will warm up and start drying out. April into mid-May is very green across these mountains with many of the higher peaks and ridges still retaining patches of snow along the basalt rim edges where cornices from wind-driven snow builds up during the late winter months. It is below these high elevation snow patches that seeps, streams, and seasonal watercourses flow downhill as these deeper accumulations of snow melt out with the rising air temperatures and longer photo periods of mid-spring. These trickles of open cold water ebb and flow as they move downslope, attracting moist soil plants to grow in them and alongside these life-sustaining watercourses. Plants like yellow monkey flower splash greens and yellow all along the routes of these flows as they work downstream. My name is Lynn Tompkins and um, here at Blue Mountain Wildlife we feel very privileged to have participated in a small way in the production of The Secret Life of the Forest. At the Wildlife Center most of the wildlife we see have been negatively impacted by people. In The Secret Life of the Forest we were given a behind the scenes tour of a world that is in our backyard but, but we don't often see. I hope you will enjoy watching this series and learning about The Secret Life of the Forest. And I'd like to take this opportunity also to give you a brief behind the scenes view of Blue Mountain Wildlife. Every year, the residents of Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington find hundreds of wild animals that have been negatively impacted by people. These animals have been hit by cars, they've collided with power lines, fences, windows, they've been mauled by cats, they've been shot with guns and secondarily poisoned by lead when scavenging another animal that has been shot with lead ammunition. Their nestlings, whose nests were destroyed when haystacks were moved and trees cut down. They're animals that have been brought to Blue Mountain Wildlife for care so that they may one day fly free again. Most are not intentionally harmed or displaced. Instead, they're finding it more and more difficult to survive in a region with a growing population and increasing urbanization. For 30 years, the residents of our region have come to rely on Blue Mountain Wildlife to provide local native wildlife a second chance. With broad community support, we've built an organization that serves the people and wildlife of a huge geographic area with a skilled staff, dedicated volunteers, partnerships with wildlife agencies and veterinarians throughout our region, and a network of other rehabilitation centers throughout the Pacific Northwest. We effectively serve an area the size of New York State. Yet we've never had a facility that truly supports the work we do or the people and wildlife we serve. For 30 years, we've been providing exceptional care to wildlife in spaces adapted for our work. The center's been located here south of Pendleton since 1997. A one-room clinic includes exam and treatment space, hospital caging, lab equipment, an x-ray machine, and storage space. It's a very crowded place. Today, we have an opportunity to build a state-of-the-art wildlife hospital and environmental education center. Our new home will be designed to help Blue Mountain Wildlife fill its mission to preserve local native wildlife through rehabilitation, research, and education. It will include a wildlife hospital, indoor and outdoor classrooms, new displays for our ambassador birds, caretaker housing, and intern housing. It will be a net zero energy use, net zero water use demonstration project showcasing how to preserve precious natural resources. If you'd like to learn more about this opportunity and to partner with Blue Mountain Wildlife, please visit our website at bluemountainwildlife.org. And I hope you'll enjoy viewing A Secret Life of the Forest. Thank you.
Now moving on to disc two of Secret Life of the Forest, the Northern Blue Mountains, in episode eight titled, Tiny Steps Towards Renewal. During February in the Northern Blue Mountains, life starts to change in small incremental measures as chemistry in the soils and plants starts to change as the photo period increases. As the snow warms and melts, it leaves bare ground patches that now warm rapidly during the extended sunlight periods of early spring. This sets the stage for the very first blooming plants of the year, bluebirds, elk, and many other species to come. Perched on the contorted branches near the top of a stunted ponderosa pine out in a lithosol opening sets a spectacular, vivid, sapphire blue male mountain bluebird. This member of the thrush family perches watching for any movement of insects on the ground or through the air. These bright blue birds have no pigment in their feathers, but rather all that unreal blue comes from refracted light. This male has arrived in the Northern Blue Mountains on this early March day, seeking out an unused woodpecker cavity in an old stump or snag. His much drabber mate has located something of interest and now hovers about 10 feet off the ground, inspecting a small patch of bare soil with emerging tiny green leaves. These birds will start nesting in late March in a nice cavity in a tight bowl of a nest constructed of fine grasses and some larger feathers from grouse, hawks, and other passerines. With their mellow soft two woo call, they keep in contact as they move about this opening. The Western Bluebird is another closely related species that also inhabits these mountains. This bluebird species is a darker, deep blue, much like the midsummer morning sky right here in the Blue Mountains.
Several elk cows move across the lithosol opening as the first long shadows of the approaching evening push out across the ground and up over several sizable basalt boulders that have tumbled out of a nearby rim. These big ungulates frequent these bunchgrass lithosols where they can find bunch grass ready to eat. Several have perked their ears up as they watch a tree line up along the crest of the ridge. All these big females are pregnant with the future of the species here in the Blue Mountains. Only Rocky Mountain elk inhabit the Northern Blues. A big bull can reach 1,100 pounds and have antlers that reach up and out for more than five feet and weigh more than 40 pounds each. These amazing bony growths are shed each late February through mid-March. A few retain their antlers into mid-April. Once these antlers drop to the ground, they provide a very important source of calcium to large numbers of native rodents like porcupines, bushy-tailed wood rats, red squirrels, chipmunks, and many mice species. However, today, many sheds, as they are now called, are eagerly hunted by folks as they can sell them for good prices. Guys will haunt these big bull elk in March until the bulls drop their rack and then these boys race out to grab them. This is a real loss to the ecology of these forests and the health of many animals that depend on these discarded antlers for nutrients and calcium. These elk leave inch-long piles of oblong pellets scattered across the ground. These pellets provide the fertilizers that these lithosol plant communities depend on. The elk will leave the open exposed areas to shelter in a stand of dense dug fir and ponderosa pine as night draws on. Hi, I'm Chris Howard, current president of Blue Mountain Audubon Society. Blue Mountain Audubon of Walla Walla is one of Southeast Washington's oldest conservation organizations. We were organized in 1971 with the goals of supporting conservation values and educating the public about the beauty of the natural world. Audubon focuses specifically on birds as a doorway into the interconnectedness of this natural world. We offer monthly field trips as a way of getting people into the outdoors to have them experience for themselves the magnificent beauty of the birds, flowers, and other wildlife in our Blue Mountain ecosystem. Our monthly membership meetings offer educational presentations of natural wonders from all around the world. With nature education, especially for children, being one of our most important goals, it was a pleasure for Audubon Chapter to support Mike Denny and Daniel Biggs in their creation of The Secret Life of the Forest. We believe that the more people are exposed to nature around them, the more likely they are to become supporters of the conservation values that are so important in protecting our natural world. I think the secret life of the forest is an eye-opening experience for anyone who follows Mike and Daniel in their unveiling of the secrets of the unique and spectacular Blue Mountain ecosystem.
Episode 9 is titled, The Rebirth of Life. Looking close to the last patches of snow from the winter, we observe fascinating insects such as snow spiders, which survive the icy conditions comfortably due to a type of antifreeze in their systems. As spring progresses, the remnants of snow continue to water the hillsides. Dry and barren in the summer months, these dry, rocky slopes turn into an amazing, colorful garden, hosting beautiful plants that support the first waves of insects and animals. Some seven years ago, on a bright fall morning, I witnessed my first Rocky Mountain goat on a basalt rim down in the Looking Glass Creek Canyon. This is a native mammal of the high Rocky Mountains and not a species one would consider as part of the fauna of the Northern Blue Mountains in Northeastern Oregon until this last decade. This unique and powerful animal inhabits rocky cliff sites at high elevations in ranges generally associated with the great mountains of the Continental Divide in Canada and the Western United States. These goats were introduced into the Wallowa Mountains in 1950. They have slowly spread across the Northern Blue Mountains with small populations scattered in several subalpine locations near springs. These pure white goats stand 3.8 feet at the shoulder and are six feet long. Both sexes have 10 to 12 inch long black horns that are never shed. A mature billy can weigh as much as 300 pounds and most adults weigh in at about 170 pounds. They normally have one kid after a 165 day gestation period. Kids are also pure white with black hooves and stand one foot at the shoulder. These herbivores prefer high exposed rocky sites and steep ridges that easily protect them from most terrestrial predators. On occasion, golden eagles will take a kid. These animals are completely protected from extreme dry cold with their dense, long, woolly fur. However, during extended periods of cool, wet weather, they will take shelter in spruce and fir tree stands. During deep snow, they will move into lower elevations to feed. These goats feed on alpine grasses, lichens, forbs, and browse some woody shrubs. It will be very interesting to watch the population develop of this recent arrival here in the Northern Blue Mountains. The spring season pulls some amazingly beautiful plants from the moist soils found under the old growth firs and other trees. Back where it is dark and sunlight mostly is blocked from reaching the ground by the heavy canopy of the old trees. These are a whole group of plants that live their entire life without chlorophyll in their systems. These are saprophytic or parasitic plants that connect their roots to those of other plants that do have chlorophyll and photosynthesize in the sunlight. These are spectacular orchids such as the purple fairy slipper or calypso orchid. These very eye-catching beauties are up and blooming not too long after the earth warms and fungi are producing fruiting bodies, such as the morel mushrooms, which often grow in the same acidic, moist soils that the calypso orchids appear in. These orchids at times arise from the ground in clumps and can be common in some locations when conditions are just right. Please, never pick these or any other orchids here in the Northern Blues as that kills the plant that has taken many years to be able to even get to the blooming stage. Be a great steward of the land and the communities that these delicate plants depend on.
Standing like silent sentinels, seven to nine inches high above the forest floor under dense canopy shade, grows yet another chlorophyll-lacking colony of pure white plants that emerge from the same tubers year in and year out. These plants have no leaves and are a saprophytic species gaining nutrients and water from the roots of nearby trees like Douglas fir and Grand fir. These spectacular white flowers and stalks emerge each year by the first week in August. When in full bloom, the white flowers grow on a straight, stiff white stalk that holds these earth-worshipping blooms to open and face down to the ground. They look somewhat like white clay pipes of the 18th and 19th century in Europe and North America. I have never found these interesting clumps of plants disturbed by any herbivores or rodents in my many years of observing them. Tucked in under the canopy of moist north slope tree stands is a beautiful evergreen that is not a conifer and has some unique properties. This eye-catching small tree grows up to 50 feet only in deep moist soils above 2,800 feet in elevation on north and east facing slopes in the blues. Yews tend to grow in tangles that make travel through them very challenging as their branches are not flexible, but stiff with many short broken branches. Large mature Pacific yew in excess of 100 years old produce an alkaloid compound known as taxol, which was found to cure some forms of cancers in humans. Pacific yews produce dozens of red berries called aurals that are semi-translucent and are eye-catching by late August and early September. The short, flat needles of this hard, wooded tree are toxic to mammals, yet the aurals are occasionally taken by birds. These beautiful trees were once considered a trash plant to get rid of during logging operations. This is no longer the case, fortunately. The Umatilla National Forest, located in the Blue Mountains of southeast Washington and northeast Oregon, covers 1.4 million acres of diverse landscapes and plant communities. Like all national forests, the Umatilla National Forest belongs to all Americans and is managed under the multiple use principle for the greatest good of the greatest number in the long run. The forest takes its name from the Indian word meaning water rippling over sand. Since time immemorial, much of the northern Blue Mountains were home to American Indian tribes that lived off these rich resources. Explorers Lewis and Clark came past this land in 1805 on their Columbia River voyage to the Pacific Ocean, and Marcus and Narcissa Whitman passed this way in 1836 to establish a mission at Wailatpu near Walla Walla, Washington. Thousands of emigrants followed the Oregon Trail westward, and many remained in the Blue Mountain country. The Umatilla National Forest was established by proclamation on June 13, 1908 and celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2008. The Umatilla National Forest offers a variety of recreational opportunities from camping, hiking, bicycling and hunting to whitewater rafting. Sightseers may drive more than 2,000 miles of forest roads, hike or ride over 715 miles of trails, pick wild mushrooms or huckleberries, select from more than 20 campgrounds throughout the forest, or float on three of the forest's wild and scenic rivers. In the winter, forest visitors can also choose from a range of activities from snowmobiling to skiing or snowshoeing. The secret life of the forest showcases the beauty of these public lands and diverse species that call the forest their home. The Umatilla National Forest is thankful to be a partner in the production of this spectacular film that is connecting our communities to the diverse landscapes in the northern Blue Mountains. We hope this film inspires you to come visit and enjoy the beauty of your national forest for yourself.
Episode 10 is titled, A Vast Stage. It is said that all of life is a stage. As the last snows at mid to low elevations vanish into the surrounding soils or melts off into streams, thus playing a vital role in the local water cycle, there is a pulse of life across this region that brings a very diverse and multicolored world to this vast stage that is the Northern Blue Mountains. Early May brings out from the wings several native flower species and black bears. Starting at the elevation of about 3,300 feet is a conifer tree species that is the only conifer that is truly not an evergreen in the Blue Mountains. This is a tree known as the Western Larch or Tamarack. This tree can grow up to 120 feet tall and be more than 60 dBh or diameter at breast height. This beautiful conifer is a favorite of most woodcutters as their dried wood has a great aroma while burning. However, this big plant is so valuable to so many wild animals as it lives and long after it dies and becomes a snag. In late September through to early November, tamaracks turn a spectacular saffron gold. And on a late sunny fall afternoon, this gold color is hard to ignore. Spring tamaracks are a bright, pale, soft green that at times get nipped by late frosts in some years. These beautiful big trees add a great beauty and regal color to the mid to high elevation forests in the Blue Mountains. Keep in mind that the spring season is the stage that launches a million new lives and propels diversity of species, size, colors, textures, sounds, scents, behaviors, habitats, along with relationships and dependencies, and yes, futures. This is the stage that constantly provides opportunity in so many different ways to so many different species that are all connected one way or the other. During the warm months of the year, there is a unique wasp species that hunts across the thin soil dry sites for spiders. These are of several different species of spider hawks that scour the ground for any size of spider. Prior to setting out on a hunt, these wasps will excavate a burrow into the soft silts five inches deep or more. After this task is completed, off they go hunting for any spider they can find. Once they locate a spider, the joust is on. These dark wasps on their long legs will advance on a spider head on and then go airborne and land right behind this spider and deliver a powerful stunning sting that incapacitates the spider but does not kill it. The wasp then aligns the limp spider's body under its center of flight, its thorax, and between its long legs, then pick up the spider and with its powerful wings, flies back to its prepared burrow where it deposits the living but limp spider. Down in the pit in the ground, the spider hawk wads the spider's living body. Once in place, the female spider hawk then lays an egg on the living drugged spider, then seals the burrow shut. Soon the egg on the spider hatches and begins to feed on the still living spider's body. This grub will eat most of the spider, then go into a pupa stage, and after metamorphing, will emerge as an adult spider hawk wasp to continue the hunt for more spiders. Also hunting these lithosol slopes and the transition zones around the edges of the forested deeper soil sites is an introduced species of large praying mantis. These large flighted, highly predatory hunting masters take all kinds of prey 
from insects to hummingbirds. A large green female can be four inches long and are very aggressive in both hunting and in self-defense. The tan brown smaller males are also fierce predators, though roughly 15% smaller than the large females. These praying mantis appear to have learning skills and know just what prey inhabits specific areas. During the late summer days, these predators can be seen flying on clear wings all along the slopes of the northern Blue Mountains. During late July, a spider species appears in the low canopy and down dead branches and woody shrubs. This spider is well known for its technical skill in the construction of its extensive web. It is known as a dome spider. This 0.7 inch long pale colored spider is a master architect and engineer in its design and construction of its amazing complicated web. This web is on the average 8 inches across and 13 inches long. It is designed as a perfect dome with an internal subdome about halfway down into the structure that acts as the travel layer that the spider uses to access different sections of its web. All parts of this astonishing web are connected and allows the spider to feel when an insect has become entangled anywhere on the outer surface of the structure. This entire dome structure is made up of thousands of one inch long silk threads connected to each other at joints. With the right angle of light, you can see this connecting silk threads as well as the internal structure that form this amazing structure. The clear silk threads are translucent and cause the entire dome to glow in the late afternoon light. Episode 11 is called Predators in Carrying Capacity. All predators that inhabit the Northern Blues provide a service that maintains their population and assists in managing and supporting their prey base by removing a percentage of prey species on a consistent basis if populations are stable. The issue is that most prey species populations are cyclic and both have high year populations and low year populations that greatly affect predators that depend on those prey species. Coyotes are another omnivore predator that catch and eat large numbers of voles and as a result will have five to seven pups due to high rodent populations during the natural seven year cycle. But when the vole populations crash, many young predators will try to find and feed on less abundant species with many starving or becoming stressed and dying from predation, disease, or parasite infestations. About every six to seven years, plagues will race through the high populations of voles and literally leave thousands of dead or dying voles littered across the ground. I have seen these events several times. One contributing factor to these mass rodent die-offs is that the population exceeded the carrying capacity of the area to support all those rodents. Another approach to control populations is the natural prompts, rapid population growth among predators to manage the exploding rodent numbers. Often the word gets out that one area has an overpopulation of voles and soon all kinds of raptors, mammals, and other predators will move into an area to cut the rodent numbers down to a manageable size naturally. Carrying capacity is a natural law that dictates the size of all living populations of animals, except when we humans have thrown in non-native introductions, pollutants, extreme predator killing, poaching, or severe habitat loss. All these actions throw the natural controls out of balance and cause all manner of major issues in the natural world. 
the most cunning and destructive predator omnivore in the northern blues, and the only one that kills just to kill, is of course the human. We have greatly altered and impacted many species cycles of life by habitat destruction, poaching, and reallocation of water. We have caused great harm to many species, even to the point of extinction of entire species populations. Species that are gone or extirpated from the blues are grizzly bear, California condor, Columbia sharp-tailed grouse, and sockeye salmon, to name a few. Conservation of habitats and species is so vitally important as each species fulfills its service and purpose here in the Blue Mountains. Invasive plants and animals are also here in the blues in growing numbers. Most of these non-native plant species were introduced into the blues via automobiles, livestock, and humans. Plants like yellow star thistle, morning glory, ventinata, spotted knapweed, along with bull thistle, and another 10 or so other invasive weeds that we have brought into the forest on ATVs, motorcycles, in cattle, in horse feed, and on pickup trucks. Animals that do not belong in the blues and are not native are wild turkey. These big birds were introduced for folks to hunt with little thought of their long-term impacts on native grouse populations. Episode 12 is titled, Life on Lithosol Slopes. Across the Northern Blue Mountains starting in mid-June are those sites that have dried out and now support some very site-specific plants that simply will not grow under shade or in moist soils. These amazing native plants flourish on lithosol slopes, as well as old gravel pits, south-facing road cuts, and on thin-soiled western aspect sites. Appearing on these unhospitable sites emerge some of the most beautiful blooming plants and some other incredible creatures. Across the Northern Blue Mountains, starting in mid-June, are those sites that have dried out and now support some very site-specific plant species that simply will not grow under shade or in moist soils. These amazing native plants flourish on lithosol slopes as well as old gravel pits, south-facing road cuts, and on thin-soiled western aspect sites. In the northern Blue Mountains, south and western facing slopes typically are thin soiled rocky sites known as lithosols, which means thin rocky soils. These slopes lack any trees and the few trees that persist are in shallow pockets of slightly deeper soils, causing these trees to be stunted and short lived. Ponderosa pines are the most persistent species with most not growing much over 10 to 15 feet in height. Because of the lack of soils, these areas are covered with a delicate grass and forb plant community that emerges early and blooms in succession as the spring season progresses upslope in elevation with each passing spring day. By mid-spring, plants like Jacob's Ladder bring into view their powder blue inflorescence that often bloom along the edges of these lithosol sites in transition zones at the edge of the forest 
and much deeper soiled areas with some midday shade. These half inch wide yellow centered flowers proceed to attract many species of pollinators. Out and away from the intermittent shade where the basalt rims and rocks cling to dry slopes grow some outstanding native plants that produce brilliant colored blooms. One such plant is the Blue Mountain Penstemon, an endemic species that grows in thick green clumps to a height of 16 inches and in most years is covered with blue purple wide mouth tube flowers an inch and a quarter long that native bumblebees crawl into to collect pollen and nectar. These eye-catching flowers are spectacular to see as they bloom out of solid basalt rock ledges and road cuts. One other late spring plant that blooms out of seemingly no soil, just rocky hot south facing sites, is the hot rock penstemon. The flowers of this tough heat resistant native plant bloom pure white and are a half inch long tube flower that attracts several species of small native bees and in the evening moths that pollinate this plant. Down below the basalt rims and rocky scree where sands and silts collect at the base of the slopes grows a most unusual hot site plant. Often located in patches growing together is this beautiful scarlet gilia. This 12 to 18 inch tall plant produces 15 to 30 scarlet red trumpet flowers that look like bursting five point shooting stars with white interior centers with red dots. All these gorgeous red blooms face down towards the ground with no convenient perches anywhere on this plant along with very narrow openings for the pollinators to access. Never mind this as the primary pollinators have no issues accessing these flowers for their nectar. During the day in the Blue Mountains it is Rufus and Calliope hummingbirds that frequent these red beauties for their nectar. My name is Kat Brigham. Uh, I'm an elected official for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. I have been in, uh, I'm an enrolled member there as well, and I am a member of a hunting and a fishing family. Hunting and fishing is very important to all of us on the reservation because it's part of our first foods. The Umatilla Tribe has adopted a first foods policy that says water, salmon, big game, Roots and berries are all part of our life, all part of our culture, are part of our future, it's all part of our history. That's why the forests are so important to us and that's why we manage really hard to protect, preserve, and enhance our natural resources. We also do this simply because we are a tribal government and we are a tribal government. Uh, people have been here for generations upon generations. We plan for the future. We plan for the next seven generations and beyond so that our children, their children, and their children's children will be able to live off the country as we do. We also recognize that by living here that we need to share our resources. And our resources are important to all of us for the future. When our treaty was signed in 1855, we were moved from this area, the Umatilla Basin area, down to northeastern Oregon. We have a reservation there. At, we, in the beginning, we had about 8,000 people in our res, um, of our whole area that covered this, the, uh, the mouth of the snake, the, the headwaters of the um, Grand Ronde, uh, Umatilla Basin, Tushi, I mean there was a lot of basins in which we traveled, plus the Columbia River. 
but we also traveled to Montana, up to Seattle area, down to California area. So our area, of Aboriginal area, was quite huge. But our seated area and our reservation are much smaller than that. But because of those, the treaty and because of our ancestors, we have a responsibility in the Pacific Northwest to take care of our, our natural resources so that they can take care of us. And that's why the forests are so important because without our forests, we don't have clean water, clean air, and, the, and plus our foods, our, our big game, our roots, our berries, and our medicines. All of those are important to us for our future. We also recognize that we can't do this alone. We have quite frankly tried to do it alone and it did not succeed. And that's why the Umatella tribe has built a lot on collaboration and partnership. We recognize that people need to work together to accomplish things that can be restored, protected and enhanced for future generations. Through this collaboration, the Umatilla tribe has done a lot of different things. On our reservation, we are the number one employee on the, in the Umatilla County. And so we also believe in economics and we have a goal of a diversifying our economics on the Umatilla reservation. We also have a goal of protecting our treaty rights in all our usual and custom areas. Like I said, is, is in the Walla Walla Basin, the Blues, the Grand Ronde, the Umatilla River, John Day, there's just a large area. And I'm not naming them all, but those are just a few. And so when we look at our future, we look at those areas. We look to plan to protect. We look to pretend, plan to enhance and enjoy our natural resources. And I have told a number of state and federal agencies, if I could put my reservation right here in front of me with all the air, with all the water, with all the forest, with all our foods right here, then we would manage our natural resources and our people for the next seven generations and beyond right here. But our water runs off the reservation. Our big game runs off the reservation. Our fish run through the reservation. And our roots and our berries, they're on and off the reservation. So that is why we look at all of our natural resources on and off the reservation and how we can protect, restore, and enhance them. It's also important for you to know that because it's not on just this area, we share it. We share our natural resources. You get to breathe air. You get to drink water. You get to come to the, the timber and see how beautiful it is. And I know there have been a few times in my life when I have been so uptight, I guess. <laughs> I said, okay, I need to go to the timber. And when I get up there in the mountains, it's so beautiful. It's so relaxing. And you can see all the uh, secrets of life there. And, and it's just a wonderful experience. And I know other people see that as well, but that helps calm people down and helps people remember this is why we're here. This is why what we're planning for in the future. It's the same thing when I, uh, happens when I go down to the Columbia River. This is why we're here. We're planning for the future. We're planning for our future and for your future because you're not leaving, but neither are we. We're here to stay, and that's why the collaboration, the partnership is very important so that we can work together to protect, restore, and enhance all our natural resources. And like I said, economy. We don't say economy is bad, but we do say economy needs to be planned in a way that recognizes that it does have an impact on natural resources. So let's say that it has a negative impact. But what can we do to mitigate? What can we do to change it, to make it protect our natural resources so that we all have it? I know in our reservation, which is, like I said, is in northeastern Oregon, we have adopted a first foods policy. So now when we do any development on our reservation, we look at what it does to our water, our, big, our fish, 
our big game, our roots, and our berries, and our medicines. If it has no impact, then we go forward with it. But if it does have an impact, we all say, okay, can we mitigate for it, or do we have to move it? You know, so those are things that we look at. We also have what we call a river vision, and so we're trying to create our rivers to be more Miranda and more natural, because the longer the water is in the basin, the longer it stays there to keep cool, to get better quali water quality, those types of things. And again, it's because of our forest. It's because of the land that's out there. And so those are some things that we do on our reservation. And those are some things that we're trying to share with the community as a whole, the stakeholders, to help us, them help us plan for our future. Because like I said, you're not going away and neither are we. But we're here to stay because of our treaty rights. We have a treaty and we stand by our treaty and we will fight to protect our treaty as often as we have to. But hopefully we will be able to do collaboration, partnership, so that we, everybody will understand that we are working for our future generations. Our last episode, episode 13, is titled, A Sense of Place. We have covered maybe three and a half percent of the native living organisms within the Northern Blue Mountains. So to add a few more species of great importance to the health of this amazing mountain range, we will share three more species that make a huge difference in the continued sustainable diversity of life in these spectacular mountains beaver, gray wolf, and the ant play vital roles in the health of the Northern Blue Mountains. Across the Northern Blue Mountains, in all habitat types, lives an apex predator that provides vital ecological services to this region. This is the mountain lion, which is also known as the cougar or puma. This is a big native cat that can reach 215 pounds and can be more than seven feet long. This is a predator that calls and maintains healthy ungulate herds. Ungulates are any species of herbivore, such as deer, elk, bighorn sheep, Rocky Mountain goats, antelope, feral horses, feral donkeys, as well as open range cattle. These big felines also prey on many other predators, such as coyotes, foxes, small black bear, bobcats, badgers, as well as most smaller mammals, native and non-native to the Northern Blue Mountains. These cats' relationship with the recently arrived gray wolf is still being scrutinized and understood, as the wolf populations have moved into areas where they have been absent for over a hundred years in these mountains. As the cats learn to live with the gray wolf population, a balance will be arrived at as when and to whom to give up a kill to, who drinks at the waterhole first, and where each species dens. Because this cat species has been the dominant wild predator of big ungulates just above the black bear for many decades, it now has to fit in between the gray wolf and bears as it looks now. Cougar's relationship with humans usually is antagonistic from most human-cat interactions. Most stockmen, deer, and elk hunters despise these big native cats as they know the cat is a skilled predator and will take any type of livestock within their large territorial range. Once again, USDA Wildlife Services is brought onto federal and private lands wherever cats have killed livestock. 
These government shooters use all kinds of lethal methods to destroy these big cats. Big male mountain lions hold territories that at times are over a hundred miles across. They make a circuit of that area throughout their 10 to 12 year lifespan. The big males regulate the yearling cougar populations by catching and killing them when these young cats are located within the mature male's territory. This in turn reduces cat populations and maintains a balanced carrying capacity of these predators. Mountain lions are vital to the regions in which they live as they provide stability in herbivore populations. The desire that some people have to eliminate these spectacular cats fail to understand these big cats' role in the natural world here in the Northern Blue Mountains. One short story that took place several years ago I had the privilege of taking two agency directors from Africa on a tour of the Umatilla National Forest around the southern edge of the Winnaha Toucanon Wilderness Area, east of the Hoodoo Trailhead. One of these distinguished gentlemen was the head of the Kenyan Wildlife Department. As we walked along the rim trail, we saw four big hooves up in the air ahead of us. Upon approaching, we saw a large elk carcass, a five-point bull in velvet. There were marks all over this bull that indicated it had been killed by a very large cougar. Its neck was broken and its muzzle had been held until the big bull slumped to the ground. The cat's claw marks were 2.75 inches apart. My African guests were amazed and Simon, the wildlife chief said, we in Africa never think of big cats killing big game in America. So remember that cougars are able hunters and part of the big picture here in the Northern Blue Mountains. In this 13 part series, we have looked at many different species of animals and plants that inhabit the Northern Blue Mountains. We have explored habitat types, talked about geologic formations, and how important slope and aspect are in the Blue Mountains. We've talked about water and erosion along with soil deposition. We started with soils and non-vascular plants and visited about lichens, mosses, and algaes, and on into the fungi and their important role in recycling and breakdown in the natural world. We have covered maybe 3.5% of the native living organisms within the Northern Blue Mountains. So to add a few more species of great importance to the health of this amazing mountain range, we will share three more species that make a huge difference in the continued sustainable diversity of life in these spectacular mountains. The sweep of time over the Northern Blues has created a spectacular range that is complicated in so many ways. It is like a beautiful fabric of relentless life that binds colors, light, topography with a huge diversity of life with sounds, movements, and the spectacular power of persistence to survive. From the piercing yellow eyes of a great gray owl to the electric sapphire blue of a mountain bluebird and the brilliant reds and greens of a mission press sockeye salmon, this mountain range speaks to a creation that is forever facing change and adapting to meet the next season of life here in the Northern Blues. Thank you for watching this 13 episode series on the secret life of the forest. This documentary on the Northern Blue Mountains is meant to educate and explain a small sample selection of many hundreds of species found in this amazing mountain range that hopefully will cause you to explore and come to an understanding of this exceptional place. Good and long lasting stewardship of this vast forest system is also a goal of this presentation. 
We, after all, are responsible for our actions in conserving the natural resources provided us. Blessed as we are with these amazing mountains from the creation ages ago to the present day, we should marvel at all life that is forever locked in relationships, dependencies, and arrangements that create balance and diversity, allowing for a future we all can appreciate. Thank you. The next big series going into production from the Blue Mountain TV is The Secret Life of the Deserts of the Pacific Northwest. This series will range throughout Oregon and Washington, looking at the natural history of the many types of deserts and the numerous species of plants and animals that inhabit them. From the wonderful, docile Ord's kangaroo rat and its amazing skills to survive, to the determination of the long-lived bitter brush to grow. We will follow a collared lizard and check out the effects of great inland marshes in Oregon's high, dry outback. This is your opportunity to contribute to and support this outstanding new series coming to the Blue Mountain Television sometime soon. For $1,000, your name or business will appear in a list of our sponsors. For $3,000, your name or business and logo will be in a standalone five second segment. For $5,000, your name or business, logo, website, and phone number will be in a standalone five second segment. Please keep in mind, Blue Mountain Television is viewer supported, and by your donation of any size, you can become a sustainer of healthy, intelligent, hopeful, and educational programming. Help us share a message of education, conservation, and love for all creation. Thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And if you ordered the DVD set, thank you so much and please consider being a sponsor of The Secret Life of the Desert and what it will mean to help educate and conserve our precious lands. Have a great evening.